So there in chapter 6, obviously a long chapter, there's a lot going on in that chapter. But what I want to focus on tonight is just those first seven verses. And if you look at verse 6 there, there's a phrase, and that's where I get the title of my message. It says, and the man of God. And what I want to preach about tonight is the man of God, and more, more specifically, the role of the man of God. I want to talk tonight about the role of the man of God. And I think if we look at these first seven verses and we just go through them uh, one at a time, we could see that uh, the importance of the role of the man of God is. Now before we get into the sermon, I want to kind of take a minute and just make sure we uh, understand what, the, what the, the term man of God even means. So if you would, just very quickly, keep, again, keep a, a hand there in uh, second, uh, second Kings chapter 6, but if you'd go over to uh, Judges chapter 13 and look at verses, uh, starting at verse 3 and Judges uh, 13. Again, we're talking about the man of God tonight, the importance of the role of the man of God. And the phrase, the man of God, um, well, we can look at the Bible to get an understanding of what that phrase means. If you look there at verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but now shalt conceive and bear a son. So there we have an angel speaking with this woman. But if you drop down to verse 6, Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me he... Neither told he me his name. So right there we see that an angel of, of God is being called a man of God. And if you drop down to verse 8, Then uh, Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. So here we have an example of, of uh, a man of God being an angel from the Lord, which is just another word for messenger, angel. So a man of God is someone who is just bringing God's message. If you turn over real quick to 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2 in verse 26. 1 Samuel 2 in verse 26. <clears throat> we'll see where that phrase, the man of God, is used once again in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor with both the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God into Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Again, the man of God is bringing the message of the Lord. So we see that again, that, that the, the man of God is somebody who brings God's message. If you go over to 1 Samuel chapter 9, just a few pages over in chapter 9, verse 6, another reference. And these are just a few places in the Bible where, the, where it uses that phrase, the man of God. In 9, 6, 1 Samuel 9, 6, it says, and he said unto him, Behold, now is the city, in the city is a man of God, and he is an honorable, honorable man. All that he saith surely come to pass. Now let us go thither, pre-adventure he can show us our way that we should go. So here we see that the man of God is, is known, or, or in, in is held in honor. Uh, he is someone to be held in honor. He speaks the truth. He's someone that can show you the way you ought to go. He's somebody that can direct you and guide you in the way you ought to go. Over in 1 Kings chapter 12, if you just go to 1 Kings chapter 12, a few pages over. 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 21. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and a hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to bring king, uh, the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came un. But the word of God came on to Shemamiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Reboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah, Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. And it goes on and explains why they shouldn't do that. So here we have an example of the man of God is somebody who's giving a warning to others. So the man, the man of God is someone who brings God's message. The man of God is somebody who's someone that ought to be held in honor. He's somebody that can guide and direct us and show us the way we ought to go. He's also a man in the Bible that gives us a warning. He, he, often the message he brings is a warning. And there's several other places, but uh, we'll just point out some people in the Bible that were called men of God. One would be Elijah. Elijah comes to mind. He was called a man of God. And of course, he was a very powerful man, did many great things for God. Elisha, who we're going to be talking tonight, he was called a man of God. If we were to go to 1 Chronicles, we won't turn there for sake of time, but Moses was specifically called a man of God twice in the book of 1 Chronicles. And the, some of the attributes that these, all man, these men had in common is that they were all leaders, and that they were all used by God to help God's people. 
And that the, I believe that this is a term that applies today. If you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, just turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Of course, we've seen several verses or several examples, and there's many others in the Old Testament that use that phrase, the man of God. And I've heard people that, that, would, that would mock and ridicule a man who would, who would get up and, and, and uh, declare himself to be a man of God or allow others to call him a, a man of God. But it is an applicable term for, for a pastor today, I believe. The Bible says in 1 uh, Timothy 6, chapter 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So there we have Paul using in the New Testament a phrase that was used in the Old Testament to describe Timothy. He was calling him a man of God. If we were to go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, that, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So again, there's that phrase again, the man of God. So now that we understand what a man of God is, that a man of God is, is a messenger that brings God, God's message. He's somebody that can instruct and guide others in the way they ought to go. He's somebody that could bring a, a warning to others. We could see how a man of God could be applied to, to the position of a pastor. And uh, if we go back to 2 Kings there in chapter 6, we'll just start going through these verses and we can see the importance, I believe, from these seven verses, the importance that the man of God plays in our lives. In 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible reads, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. So they'd been dwelling with, uh, um, with Elisha for some time, and the place where they had been dwelling with, uh, with Elisha had grown too straight, meaning it had gone, there wasn't enough room that, for them to grow any longer. So that tells me something about Elijah, because obviously Elisha took over, as we know in other stories, he took over the mantle for Elijah. And Elijah at that time had a following. He had people that were, uh, you know, that were following him. There was at least 70 prophets we know of that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And, but at, at, so after time, I believe that when people saw the, the, the mantle passed on to Elisha, that Eli and the things that Elisha did, he actually began to grow. Other people began to come to him. And uh, that would be a, an, a, an example of uh, the answered prayer that Elijah had, that he would have that double portion of Elijah's spirit. He was given that double portion, and as a re result, other people were drawn to Elisha, the man of God. So here again in this, in this verse, we see a group of men who had decided to dwell with the man of God, Elisha. And the fame and influence of Elisha had exceeded that of his predecessor, Elijah, and again, that was an answer to his prayer in, in chapter 2, verse 9. Now, Elisha was a very powerful man of God. And I'm just going to go very quickly through some of the, just a few of these uh, the miracles that Elisha had done up to this point. And um, there's, a, there's a common element in all of them. And once we get through them, we'll kind of take a look real quick at what that is. But the Lord by Elisha delivered King Jehoshaphat and Judah from the Moabites. So he delivered an entire nation of people from the enemy by the hand of Elisha. Elisha performed the miracle of oil to deliver the widow's woman's son from the creditors. Elisha blessed the couple in Shunem who had been barren and they conceived a son. He later healed that same son and brought him back from the dead after he had prayed to the Lord. And the, the, the child received his spirit again. Elisha made the pottage that uh, uh, fit to eat when there had been poison during a dearth in the land. And he fed the prophets, uh, the uh, sons of the prophets with that pottage. Elisha gave away the gift of bread and corn that had been given to him and miraculously fed 100 men with 20 loaves and had left over to spare. Elisha healed Naaman, the captain of, uh, of Syria, of his leprosy, without even speaking to him to his face. He just sent the word by, by hand of his messenger, and he was able to heal uh, Naaman, uh, the, the captain. And he, Elisha also cursed Gehazi with the same leprosy when he covered after the gifts of, gifts of Naaman. So we see that Elisha, just from these few examples, was a very powerful man of God. But if you would turn over to chapter 2, again, just keep a finger in there all night in, in, in chapter 6. We're going to keep coming back to it. But if you go back a few pages to chapter 2, we're going to look at uh, some of the things, the beginning of Elisha's ministry. And if you look at there in, in chapter four, or verse 14 of chapter 2, excuse me, 2 Kings 2.14, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view uh, at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth, rest, Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. 
So we can see here that the, that was one of the very first things that Elijah, or Elijah did was that he smote the rivers of Jordan and he, and he parted the waters and crossed over. And the, and the prophets, the sons of the prophets were there to witness this. And that was one of the, uh, that first miracle validated the position of Elisha in their eyes. They, they said, surely, uh, you know, the spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. That was the demonstration of God's power that validated Elisha as the man of God. If you go to verse 19 and 22, the Bible says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord doth see. But the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, put, Bring me a new cruise, cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, there shall not from thence any more be there from there shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day. So we see again that Elisha was able uh, to use his uh, 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 position as a man of God to help others. And these people, when they had this problem with these with these waters, you know, causing all the uh, the barrenness in the land, they they knew who to call on. They knew that Elisha had become the man of God in Elijah's place, and they knew and respected that position as the man of God and asked him to come and, and to do a work. And down there in verse 23, we'll look at one other thing here. The Bible says, And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him, and said to him, Go up, up thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. So we see that uh, those that disrespected the man of God, they were punished in a pretty severe way, and they were punished in the name of the Lord. So those are a few things that we can learn about the man of God, but what we can glean from this chapter here is that when we see the evident working of God in a man's life, we would do well to do, give that man his due respect for our own benefit. Uh, in these miracles, we also see that in every one of these miracles that Elijah performed, they were all for other people. They were for their benefit. Elisha was unaffected by these miracles. Others were affected, for better or worse, by, the, by either being blessed or cursed by the man of God, but Elisha himself remained unaffected because Elisha's position as the man of God was to serve and help others. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So the profit there that, that of, of a good report is for you. It's unprofitable for us, people who, who are under a man of God, to, um, to, to have a bad report given an account of us. It's profitable for us to have that good report. It does not affect the man of God. We must understand that a genuine man of God is there to benefit you rather than himself. Amen. That is the role of the man of God. He is there to benefit the people that he is overseeing rather than himself. In Acts 20, Paul uh, told the elders of Ephesus, Take heed to, therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer, overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So he's telling them, look, you guys need to go back into Ephesus and you need to feed the church of God. It's a, it's the, being a man of God, being the pastor, is a position where you are feeding the sheep. Now the main point of the sermon that I want to make is that we need to have a man of God in our life Amen. in order to direct our way and to help us in the work of God. We need to have a man of God in our life to help us in our way and to direct us in the work of God. The office of a bishop today is under attack. The, the pastorate, the man of God, it's, it's being ridiculed, it's being downplayed, and it's importance. And the fact that it's being attacked so heavily by all these different angles that we're not going to get into tonight, but the fact that it's being attacked ought to tell us that, it, that in, its, uh, in and of itself is the, it tells us that it is an important role. The devil isn't going to go after unimportant issues. He's not going to go after somebody that isn't important. He's going to go after the main leader. He's going to go after the, 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 the person of the most importance, and which is why the, we are seeing the position of a pastor being attacked. And uh, it's a very important position. It has a great deal of responsibilities. In 1 Peter 5, the Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, 
but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of, glo crown of glory that fadeth not away. So in those verses, we see some of the responsibilities that a pastor, a man of God has. It one, it's to feed the flock. It's to take the oversight of it, to be responsible for the flock and what they're being taught and what, what, how they're uh, serving God with their lives. And it's to be, in a, you know, probably most of all, the greatest responsibility is being that example to the flock, to leading them by a good example. We're going to look at that a little bit more um, later on the sermon, the importance uh, and, and the, the great responsibility that a pastor has to lead his flock by the example that he sets. Now, if we go back to our story there in 2 Kings chapter 6, where we were, the, we could see that um, we're, as we move along there in those verses that the sons of God knew the importance of having the man of God present in the work of God. I'll say that again, that the, that the sons of the prophets understood and knew the importance of of having the man of God with them as they endeavored to do the work of God. They understood that having the man of God present with them was important when they were trying to accomplish the work of God. In verse 2, the Bible says, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there that we, where we may dwell. And he answered and said, Go ye. But one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he said, I will go. Now it's interesting, and I don't know maybe perhaps the full meaning of it, where at the first he answered Elijah, when they asked him to go with him, he says, no, you guys go. He says, go ye, go without me. You go, you do the work of God. I, I tend to think that he was t kind of testing these guys, if they understood the importance that he played in the work of God. And if it was a test, well, they, pla they passed in flying colors because they go on, they, they, they continue to implore him. They didn't accept that answer. They said, no, you need to come with us. Because the sons of the prophets understood the importance of the man of God in trying to accomplish the work of God. Not only did they understand, Elisha himself understood the importance the man of God plays in the work of God. Because the Bible, go, the story reads on there in verse 4 where it says, So he went with them. See, Elijah understood, Elisha understood the importance of the man of God plays in the work of God. Notice this in verse 4. He went with them. And then the Bible says, And when they, meaning Elisha, the man of God, and the sons of and, and the sons of the prophets. So we went from just Elisha, he went with them, singular, to a group talking about the whole group now. He, and when they came to Jordan, watch what happens next, they cut down wood. I am a firm believer that Elisha, when they got to Jordan, picked up an ax, picked out a tree, and started swinging. Because Elisha understood the importance that the man of God plays in accomplishing the work of God. And he understood that it's important for the people uh, that are um, looking to the man of God to see him doing the work. It says that they cut down the wood. Now, I can kind of uh, uh, relate to this story a little bit because when I lived in Michigan, we had a I had a, a job with an excavation company and every now and then we'd have to go out and do what's called a lot clear, which is when somebody decided to build a new house on, on uh, unbroken land, we would have to show up there, our crew with chainsaws and wood chippers and excavators and bulldozers, and loaders, and we'd have to, you know, clear out a, t a one or two acre plot of land of all the trees. And it was a lot of fun, actually, following all those trees and running the chipper. It was actually kind of a fun job. But before we got there, before we even showed up, there was another guy that would work for the company that would meet with the contractor after they got the work, and they would go around on the site with the home builder and the contractor, and they would pick out which trees stay and which trees go. Now, I have a hard time believing that Elisha was that guy. I have a hard time believing Elisha was just the guy with the spray paint or the little ribbon wrapping around trees and just waiting for everybody else to show up and do the work. I mean, if we just even think about the idea that Elisha went there with these guys, the sons of the prophets, to Jordan to, to start cutting down wood, just the ridiculousness of him, of him just kind of standing by and, and you know, say, we'll get that one and then that, get that one. No, I believe that Elisha got right in there and, and started chopping wood with them. Because he probably knew, too, that that's the, that's, the, that's the fun thing to do, is to fall down the trees. But when we see the man of God working alongside us, it reminds us of the importance of the work that we're doing. And I think Elisha understood that. When, he, when, when the, the men there that were chopping down the trees to fall the, fall the timber and build the house of God, when they looked over and they saw the man of God working alongside them, it made the work that they were doing seem very important. Because obviously the man of God is an important person and whatever he's doing must be important. So when we see, we're able to look over to the man of God and see him doing a work, we can see that whatever he's doing, if we can share in that work, you know, it, it, in a way it kind of puts us on a little bit of a more uh, even playing field as far as getting the work done. That uh, doing the work with the man of God shows us how important the work of the man of God is. 
Now, while, if you would, please turn over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8. Verse 8, 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3. Again, Elisha understood the importance the man of God plays in the work of God. He understood that, uh, that when we see the man of God working alongside us, it elevates the work. It, uh, it makes it seem important, the work that we are doing. And Paul understood this as well. And I want to take a minute and kind of and break this down a little bit. But if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 8 through 10, the Bible says in verses 8 through 10, Now as now as Jan uh, Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as, there was, as, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them the Lord delivered them, uh, the Lord delivered me. Now, Paul is here is contrasting himself with the men he's just got done describing in verses 2 through 9, and we're not going to go that. He's, he gives a, a list of, you know, of some pretty bad attributes that these people have, and then he contrasts himself and he, with these men, and he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. He says, I'm not like these guys, Timothy. He's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you know who I am. You know what I have done. You've seen what I've done. You've seen the things I've endured. You know these things about me, Timothy. He's contrasting himself to these other men. Okay, and this is significant because when we get down to chapter 4, in verses, in, beginning in verses 1, he lays a charge on Timothy. He lays a charge on Timothy. He says, Timothy, this is what I want you to do. Let's read there. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but will, after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, Tim, so he, we see there that one, Paul contrasts himself again in, in verse 3 with these other men. And he tells Timothy, hey, you know who I am. You know what I'm about. And then he lays the charge on Timothy. And the integrity of Paul's character is what gave weight to that charge. When we get to chapter 4 and he's laying that charge upon Timothy, these aren't just idle words to Timothy. Timothy, these, wor these words that he's giving, this charge has weight because Timothy knows what Paul is made of. And if we look there in uh, verse 14, Paul says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He's saying, Timothy, continue to do these things. Do this charge that I'm about to lay upon you because you know who you've learned them from. Okay? He's saying, My, you've seen what I've gone through. You know who I am. And because of that, I want you to continue and, I, and I'm going to lay this charge on you. Now, it's interesting that what we're getting at is that Elisha understood the importance of the man of God that he plays in the work of God. He understood it was important for the people of God to see the man of God sharing in the work. And here, in this passage, we see Paul has the same mindset. Because if we compare what, how Paul describes himself up there in verse 3 to the charge that he lays upon Timothy, we're, we can see that Paul is telling Timothy to do things that he himself has done. If you look there in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Thou hast fully known my doctrine. If you go down to verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, he tells them to preach the word with all longsuffering and doctrine. If you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Thou hast fully known my manner of life. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 2, he tells them to be instant in season, out of season. That, my friend, is a manner of life. To be instant in season and out of season is like Paul when he said, You know my manner of life. He's telling them this is what he, how he wants them to be. Chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Thou hast known my purpose. And what was Paul's purpose? He said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And then he tells, he tells Timothy down there in chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. So he's telling him to preach the word when he himself is a man who, whose purpose was to preach the word. Chapter 3, verse 10, he says, thou hast fully known my long suffering." And in chapter 4, verse 2, he says to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In chapter 3, verse 10, he says, thou hast fully known my patience. And he tells Timothy in chapter 4, verse 5, Watch thou in all things. In chapter 3, 11, he says, thou, you, know, you have known my persecutions and afflictions. 
And that way, because he, he knew that Timothy had seen these things, he had seen Paul endure afflictions, he was able to lay that charge on him in chapter 4, verse 5, where he tells him to endure afflictions. So again, Paul understood something. He understood that it was important that the man of God be seen doing the work of God because it would, it would allow him, it would give him credibility and validity to lay that same charge upon another man. It wasn't just this, it was a, it was a do as I do, not a, just a do as I say. He, it was kind of a thing, if that makes sense. And that was something that Elisha understood when we go back to our story there. You see, when we esteem those that labor among us, it exalts those that we share the work with. When we esteem others that labor among us, it exalts the work that we share with them. In 1 Thessalonians 5.12, it says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. I think it's very interesting that phrase that he says, you should know them that labor among you. You know, we don't want to keep those people that labor among us, that admonish us, that encourage us. We don't want to keep those people at arm's length. We should know them. Like Timothy knew Paul. We should know their afflictions. We should know their manner of life. We should know their long suffering. We should know their doctrine. We should know their purpose. We should know these things about the people that labor among, this, among us. Not only that, we should also esteem them. And not because of who they are necessarily or the position that they have, although I think that if it's a legitimate position, if you're legitimately put in that position, you've already kind of proven yourself to a point where you should be a little bit more highly esteemed. But it's, it's not for what they do or necessarily for who they are, but, or it, excuse me, it's esteem them for who they, what they do and not who they are. Esteem them from what they do. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, it's said there. So Elisha understood the importance of the man of God plays in the work of God. Paul understood it. <clears throat> and we ought to esteem those that share in the work of God with us. And when we do that and we see the man of God sharing in the work with us, it esteems the work that, that we're doing. Now moving on our story, we're going we're gonna to continue again tonight. We're, we're learning about the importance of the role of, uh, that the role that the man of God plays. The, the importance that the role of, of the man of God plays. In 2 uh, Kings chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible goes on and says, uh, let me make sure I'm on the right page here real quick. Yeah, okay. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 5, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now there's quite a few, there's, there's some things that are crammed into this one verse that if we just take a minute and kind of dwell on it, I think we can make application and, and glean something from it. Now, first of all, it says that the axe was borrowed. And I, what I want to do at this point is kind of take that axe head and I want us to imagine and, and, and apply that as, as if the axe, axe head were our life. You know, our, the axe head, the axe is, is our life in service for the work of God, to accomplish the work of God. We have the man of God there to help guide and direct and to show it as an example of how to chop down that tree, how to use his life as an axe. And I want us to kind of imagine for a minute that our life is that axe. Our lives, like the axe, are not our own. As it says there, it was borrowed. And we must use them wisely in, in, in service for God. It was borrowed. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What know you not your, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, our lives as Christians, if we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if we've been purchased uh, with that precious blood of a lamb as if without spot, then we have to understand and recognize that our life is no longer our own. We've been redeemed. God has bought us. And He wants us to use our lives in the service for God. And, you know, just like this axe is being used, it's being used to accomplish a work for God, but there's some things that can happen to that axe that are going to affect its, uh, its usefulness in the work of God. The Bible goes on and says there, as one was felling a beam. You see, the person there that was working for God, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. You know, he was cutting down the tree. That's what they went there for. That's what that tool was supposed to be used for. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was felling a beam. And he was using the right tool for the job. But nonetheless, in the service for God, that axe wore out. That axe got, began to get dull. That axe came loose and eventually flew off the handle and landed in the River Jordan. Now, the axe didn't break because of misuse. Often, you know, if you use a, the wrong tool for the wrong job, you'll end up breaking it. 
But it, you, it was not, did not break because of misuse. It broke from being used the way it was intended to be used. And the same thing can happen in our lives, even though we're doing the things we ought to do. Because let's face it, the, doing the work of God, the labor of God, is not always easy. You know, it's, it's, called the, you know, it's called labor for a reason. It's called work for a reason because it's not easy, which is why so many people aren't doing it anymore. For example, one of the greatest works we could do, probably the most important work we could do, is to go soul winning. And that's hard work. It's hard work to go out there on a consistent basis and have people, you know, slam the door in your face or tell you no. But, you know, and, we, and see people, even when we see people getting saved, in order to get somebody saved, you're going to have to know the Bible. You're going to have to be able to present the gospel in a way. It's hard work. And like, like anything else, hard work wears, can wear us down. We can be worn down in the work of God. The axe head, did, axe head did not break because of misuse. It broke from being used the way it was supposed to be used. Now, when it did break, the axe head, the Bible says, fa it, it fell. The axe head fell, and we know that it fell in the River Jordan. Now, despite doing the proper work, the tool, the tool wore out. And axe heads, they do not come loose suddenly. If anyone's ever you know, used a sledgehammer or any kind of a wooden you know, striking device, you'll start to notice when that thing, you, know, you, you, you start nailing like this, and then after a while, if that thing comes loose, you kind of start nailing like this. You know, kind of stand aside. And, and if a guy's swinging a sledgehammer, you know, you're always told, don't stand anywhere where that thing might go flying off because it happens. And the axe head does not come loose suddenly in this story. It came loose, with it came loose over time with use. And an axe head that's not being used is not going to wear out. It's not, you know, it didn't, get, it didn't fall apart because it was sitting in the tool shed in the corner. It came loose because it was being used. And the same thing with our lives. If we're going to be, you know, the, the Christian who's not feeling the burden of the ministry, the Christian who's not feeling you know, the weight of having to do the work of the Lord is a Christian who's not doing it. And that's the same way with that axe. You know, the axe that's being used is the one that's going to wear out. Now, we must pay attention to the condition of our axes, which is our lives. We must pay a condition, attention to the condition of our axes, our lives, and not let them fall into disrepair from overuse. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put, put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. We ought to be wise in how we go about serving God. We ought to be wise and efficient in the way. Because let's face it, hopefully everybody in this room, I believe, is in this for the long haul. They're in this until glory. That they're going to work for God until the day they die. That's a, that could be a very long time. And if we're, you know, we go out there guns a-blazing and it, you know, trying to set the whole world on fire all at once, we might burn out. And a lot of times, and anyone knows, once you fall out of the service for God, it's a lot harder to get back in. You know, now you have all this guilt and this baggage that you've got to drag along with you. So it's very important that we pay attention to the condition of our lives. What, you know, as far as what, you know, we're doing all this work here, but is something else being neglected that's just as important? We ought to make sure that we, we don't let our, our lives fall into disrepair in one area because we're so gun ho about another. There's a balance that must be that we have to strike there. The key to to I believe to being in it for the long haul, to not burning yourself out, is to pace yourself. We need to learn to pace ourselves. You know, have a designated time that we go out and we do soul winning. We you know X amount of hours that we're going to put in every week, or X amount of time we're going to. Uh, we're going to preach the, or uh, to read the Bible and all of that thing, those kinds of things that we had to have that kind of thing plotted out in our lives and make sure that it's striking a balance that we're spending the time with our family and not neglecting our children and, and raising them up in the nurture and the admonition of and admonition of the Lord and spending time with our spouse as as we should. And we have an example, and I've been in ministries where it almost seems like it's the complete opposite. It's just go, go, go all the time, 24-7. The less you're doing, the less, the less you love God. It seems to be the kind of way they look at things. If you're not just out there every day doing everything you can and, and not just wholly given over to, to, to you know, building, the, building the church building or building a, you know, a, a, some kind of you know, extracurricular ministry other than soul winning, then you know, you're not really in it. But the example that we see in Scripture is that Jesus himself did set a pace, that he took time apart and had a time of respite where he, he rested from the work. In Mark 6, uh, 31, the apostles had returned from going out two by two and preaching. And the Bible says, And they said, he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Jesus wanted his disciples, after they had gone out and done the work, there was a time that he wanted them to take a rest. He said, you guys have been working hard. Let's take a little break here. It's important that we pay attention to the condition of our lives so we do not fall apart with overuse. <clears throat> the Bible's, you know, 
And another thing is that we, uh, we shouldn't get so busy in the work of God that we forget the God we're working for. I think that's another thing that we can fall into. We can get so busy about the mo going through the motions of everything that we know we're supposed to be doing for, for God. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. We should still do them. And we all, every now and then I think we have to do a little bit of a heart check and say, why are we doing this again? And we need to understand that uh, we don't want to get too busy again in the work of God so much so that we forget the God that we're working for. And Jesus, after he is an example of this, after he had fed the 5,000 in Matthew 14, the Bible says in straightway, Jesus constrained disciples to get into a ship and to go before him on the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So even Jesus, our example that we look to and how we ought to serve God, took time away from, from the people, from even from his own disciples and his friends, to get alone with God and to spend time with God. We ought to make sure that we have a, a consistent and a prayer life that where we spend time with God. If you would please turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're talking about the Acts right now, that our life is like that Acts. And that uh, we do not want our, um, our lives to fall into disrepair. And even though that Acts was being used to, to do the right thing, to do the things that was, it was intended to be used for, if we're not careful, uh, it can fall apart on us, and, and then we, we have a whole other list of problems. But if you look there in uh, Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, 1038, the Bible says, Now it came to pass as they, as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she, come, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What was the one thing that was needful that Mary chose that was not going to be It was when she sat at Jesus' feet, that she did not get so cumbered about all the serving that did or did not need to take place. But she made sure that when, when there was a time and a place that she sat with God and she spent time with God. Again, the point is that we should not get so busy in the work of God that we forget the God we're working for. Because really, even if we're doing the work of God and we're neglecting God himself, it's, it's, it's for naught. The Bible says in chapter, uh, Psalms 127, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman worketh, watcheth in vain. Those are well-known verses, but it, it continues on in chapter 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. See, God, I believe God, yes, wants us to do the work of God. God wants us to go to Jordan, get the axes out, and do that work of God, to have the man of God in our life, that we should be able to look unto him, and, come and do a work for God. But I also believe that God has made it very clear in the Scripture that we ought to be careful and strike that balance and make sure that we, we spend time with God and that, that you know, He's not, God's not just up there like some harsh taskmaster just whipping us, making sure He gets every ounce of work out of us that He can. There's a time to rest. There's a time to, to, to meditate on the Word of God, to, to, uh, to think on the things of God. And see, we need to keep in close contact with God's people and we need to be in closer contact with God and in that way, by doing that, we will accomplish more together with God's blessing than otherwise. If we're in church, if we're with the man of God, if we're doing the work that God has ordained for us to do, and we're, and we're not neglecting these other areas of our life, and we're spending time with, the, with God, we're going to accomplish more for God. We need to have God's blessing on it. We need to spend, we, and we, again, we need to be in the church, and we need, to, we need to be around others. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. If we want to be a sharp axe that God is going to use, we want to be around other people who are, you know, who have, uh, they also have axes. And maybe they could tell you, hey, here's one way to keep your axe sharp. Here's one way to keep your life on track where you can make it that long haul, where you can uh, accomplish more for God. Now, moving on in our story there, after that axe head had felled, the son of the prophet, he cries out, and he says there, Alas, Master! Notice that he cried out. Notice who he cried out to. When that axe head, when that axe finally did wear out, and when that axe head went flying, 
he knew who to call to. He called to the master. He called out to the man of God. He asked the man of God for help. And the point I want to make on this is that, you know, we don't need to, we should not be afraid or embarrassed to ask for help from the man of God. That's their job. As we saw earlier, that's part of what they do. They're there to help us. They're there to encourage us. They're there to help us recover that broken axe head and, and keep our lives together. And how do they do that? Through the preaching of the Word of God, through sound wisdom uh, taught from the Bible. Um, and I'm just going to move along here for the sake, sake of time, but the point I want to make there is that if we do find ourselves where that axe head in our lives is coming loose, where we're wearing down the work of God, we should feel comfortable and we should be willing and understand that it's a good thing for us to go and cry out to the man of God. Say, you know, I'm really struggling in this area. I'm not saying like some kind of, you know, confessional booth where we got to go out and like, you know, spill our guts about all the sin in our lives, you know. But I mean, definitely if, if we're being worn down, if, there's, if we're having troubles, if we're having struggles in our lives, the man of God is there. He has the wisdom of God through the Bible and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and probably from his own experiences, as we saw with Paul and Timothy, that he, he can glean from his own experiences that he's probably been through the same thing you have. If he's been serving God and he can help us to, uh, to, to recover our lives and, to, and to, to go back to the work of God. Now in verse 6 there, after that axe had fell and the son of the prophet cried out, the Bible says, And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. <clears throat> now I want to look at that first phrase where he says, And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. So it wasn't enough that the, this guy cried out to the man of God for help. When the man of God came and said, okay, what's the trouble? Where's this thing at? He had to be honest about where, where it was. And it's the same thing for, for us. If we want the man of God to be able to help us in our lives, if we want the preaching of the word of God to help us, if we want the, the, the wisdom that we can glean from a man of God to help us, we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are spiritually. If we, we, you know, there, if we don't acknowledge you know, the, the areas that we're struggling or where we might have a problem, then you know, we're not being honest about that. How is the man of God going to know that? He's not a mind reader. We've got to be honest about where we're at spiritually in order for the man of God to be able to help us. When he came to him, he said, where fell it? And he told him right where it was. You know, if he'd been embarrassed for some reason that the axe had fell in the river and said, oh, it's over there behind that tree, you know, you know, it wouldn't have made any sense. He had to be honest about where that axe head had fell. And we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are spiritually. We have to recognize our shortcomings. We have to recognize our failures. We have to recognize our sins if we're ever going to move past them. If we're ever going to get help from the preaching of the, of the Word of God, from the man of God, or, the, or the, the, the instruction we can receive from him, we have to be able to, to recognize where we're falling short. Amen. And we have to be able to, because uh, otherwise we're not going to be able to move past those things. We're not going to be able to grow. We're not going to be able to get that axe head back and back in service. Now, the man of God is there to help us to recover, if need be. And he's there to help us to continue in the, in, in the work of God. And uh, I'm going to skip some things here, but the Bible says in Luke 22, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So there again, Jesus, a man of God, is. we see him, he's there to help, even though... He knows Peter's going to deny him. Even though he knows that Satan wants to tempt and to sift Peter as wheat, he's praying for them. He wants him to succeed. The man of God is there to help us. The man of God is there to help us to continue in the work of God. The Bible says in James chapter 5, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's a good thing when we have a man of God in our lives. It's important that we have that, a man of God in our lives who is a fervent man of prayer who knows how to pray for us and what to pray for us. That will help us. You see, we receive mercy from God when we are faithful to his work. I think... You know, I think God, you know, not that he's approving or is going to let things slide necessarily, but I think we can find a little bit more grace and, and mercy from God when he sees that we're at least trying. When he sees that we're at least attempting to, you know, to stay faithful as we can. And though we have things come up, because let's face it, we're all sinners. We're all going to fall short. We're all going to mess up and slip up here and there. But we're going to have a lot more, I, I believe, mercy from God when we're going out and we're showing mercy to others. The Bible says in Psalms 18, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. 
Now, moving on in our story there, again, in verse 6, the Bible says, after the, the man of God, or the son of the prophet, had cried out, and, and the man of God asked him where it was, and he told him where it was, this is how Elijah gets the axe head out. He cut down a stick and cast it in thither. Now, my first question is, well, you know, we just read a few verses earlier, or a few chapters earlier, where Elijah took the mantle, remember that, he took the mantle off, Elijah's mantle, Elisha took it off, and he smote the waters, the same river, the River Jordan, and split the waters hither and thither. And I wonder if this son of the prophet that's, that just lost his axe head is one of these guys that witnessed this. And if he's, if he's thinking to himself, okay, here comes the man of God, he's going to get that axe head out of that river, he's going to take off that mantle, this is going to be awesome, he's going to split that water again, but that's not what he does. The man of God comes, Elisha, he cuts off a stick, and he throws it at the axe head. That's all he does. So, you know, the, the, and I believe, and what I want to try and do here is, is you know, is liken that stick unto like the preaching of the Word of God. You know, that's what God has ordained for us to grow. That's how, that's how God, what God, that's the, 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 the method that God wants to use to help us grow as Christians is the preaching of the Word of God. And that stick, I believe, Elijah throwing it in there, we can liken that unto the preaching from the man of God. Um, God uses the preaching of the man of God to recover our lives and our service. And that stick is the preaching of the Word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 that the rod, which is a stick, right, and reproof. Now, if we come to hear hard preaching, we're going to get reproved sometime. So the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You see, hard preaching by the man of God can a lot of times be like a verbal spanking. You know, we all love hard preaching and so, until it starts to land in our lap. But that's what we need, and I believe that's kind of like that stick. You know, when we're trying to get our lives right, when we're trying to get that axe head back, get it sharpened up, get it back in the work of God, we need to be under that hard preaching. We're having those sticks thrown at us, trying to get us to come back out of it, you know, snap us out of whatever, you know, mire we've sunken down into. The hard preaching by the man of God is what it, was what it takes to bring us out of that. The Bible says in Ecclesiast Ecclesiastes 12 that the words of the wise are as goads, and a goad is a stick that's used to poke and prod an animal and cause it to go along. When, uh, when, uh, when Jesus Christ appeared to the, the Apostle Paul on, on the road to, to Damascus, he says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Because, and what he's talking about is that stick, you know, pricking. They used to prick like a, like a mule. That's how you get these animals to move along. And I believe what Jesus is saying, it's hard for you to do that, Paul. Meaning that for some time, I believe God had been dealing with Paul in his heart. He'd been poking at him, you know, what do you, you know doing all these things. But that's what we need. We need the hard preaching. We need the stick of preaching. We need the, the goad of preaching thrown at us so that we might recover our axe head, our lives, and keep it in good order. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 25, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Now that's kind of an interesting s statement. A soft tongue breaketh the bone. Now I don't think what the Bible's saying here is that, you know, a nice, easy answer is what's going to, you know, cause you to break and submit and say, yeah, you're right. Now, what it's saying is that something... I think what it's, it was trying to say is that hard preaching, which is something that's done with your tongue, can break your bones. You see, Paul did not charge Timothy to be a yes man. He didn't tell him, you know, don't rebuke, don't exhort. You know, he didn't tell him to, to not refute them. You know, he, he told him, no, reprove, rebuke, exhort. He told them to not be a yes man. And the fact is, you do not want a yes man for, your, for the man of God. You do not want a yes man as your preacher. You want somebody who's going to give it to you straight, someone who's not afraid to throw the stick of the hard uh, uh, preaching of the Word of God into your life because that's what's going to help us. Hard preaching is what works. You see, when, when this man of God showed up and threw that stick, you know, contrary to what, that other, what the son of the prophet might have expected, he might have expected him to part those waters, but God ordained that he use that stick. And we should not expect God to go beyond what he has ordained. We shouldn't expect God to do something different than he has done for everybody else. You know, do, do something different for me. You know, handle me differently. Do some great miracle, miraculous thing for me, even though, you know, you handle all, everybody else the same way through the preaching of the Word of God. We shouldn't expect God to go beyond what He has ordained. You see, um, your pastor, the pastor, anybody's pastor, does not have a magic wand. I've, you know, I've been in different churches for, for a while now, and you'll see people that'll come in, and they'll come to the pastor, and I remember... My old, one of my old pastors came to me and told me this. He said, some people come to me and they think I have a magic wand. 
They don't want to sit under the hard preaching of the Word of God. They don't want to do what the Word of God says to get their life straightened up and get it back in service for God. They want to come to the pastor, get an easy answer. They want to just pull out a magic wand and bring, like some kind of fairy godmother, just miraculously change their life and, and whip everything around and pull them out of whatever mess they're in. But that's not how it works. The two tools that the man of God has to help people is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Amen. And, how, and, and with that in mind, we have to understand that how we handle hard preaching, how we handle being rebuked by the Word of God is going to determine how far we go in, in serving God. How we handle being rebuked, how we handle hard preaching is going to determine how far we go in our service for God. You know, we, and I've, I've sat under some hard preaching, and I've heard some, and some things have come right down my alley. And I said, you know what? He's right. That pastor is right. What he's preaching is right. I need to fix that. And as a result, I'm still in it today. And that goes for a lot of people. And we're going we're gonna to be able to handle rebuke. We're going to be able to handle our hard preaching when we understand something. That your pastor is not out to get you. He doesn't have some personal vendetta where he's trying to just, you know, cut you down and make you feel bad. What he's trying to do is just preach what the Bible says. And if that, if that hits a little close to home, then, then good. That's a good thing. You know, because that's what's going to bring us, that's what's going to bring that axe head back. That's what's going to keep our axes sharp. That's when it's going to keep us uh, chopping away at the Word of God. The Bible says in Psalms 141, verse 5, Let the righteous smite me. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me, and it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. Being reproved, being rebuked, you know, it's kind of like being smited by, if, if it's the righteous, if it's a righteous person doing it, if it's the man of God that's doing it, the Bible's saying here, it's a kindness. It's like an excellent oil. Now, moving on quickly here in verse 6, the Bible goes on and says, after that Elijah had cast in the stick thither, the Bible says, and the iron did swim. And that's really one of those, this is just one of those miracles that's just tucked in there with all these other miracles that, that Elijah has done. It's kind of just, you know, when it gets glanced over a lot, but it's really, you know, I think it has a lot of symbolism, and I think it's a very, uh, it's just an interesting one, that the iron did swim. And the point I want to make about that is that, is that preaching works. That's what's going to bring us back. That's what's going to keep us in store, is the preaching of the Word of God. That's what works. The Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Being reproved are, is the way that we're instructed. The Bible says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. See, when we, when we hear the, the preaching of the word of God, and, 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 and our, you know, that's what is going to keep us in service, that's what's bringing the axe head back to, to, to flow it, causing it to swim. Now, you've got to remember that this axe head was in the river Jordan. It wasn't in a lake, it wasn't in a pond, it wasn't in a little pool. It was in a river, and rivers all have something called a current. It's all going one direction. It's try and so this axe head, in order for it to swim, had to resist that current. It had to go against the grain. It had to go against the current that was trying to pull it away from the work of God. That was trying to keep it down in the bottom of the river. That, in order for that thing to float and swim and come to the surface, it had to resist the current that was opposing it. And the preaching of the Word of God is what works. It's what helps us resist the current that would carry us away from God's Word. Now, the iron didn't just float. It says that it's, it's, it, it, it swam. It, it swam, and it, I believe, if, as we go on here, we'll see that it moved towards the bank of the river. Because in verse 7, it goes on and says, Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and put out his hand, and he took it. So not, when this it didn't just float to the, the surface. It had to resist that current in order to come over to where it needed to be, and it came up right near the feet of the Son of the Prophet and the Man of God. You see, the point I want to make here in closing is that the man of God can only bring us so far. He can only show us so much. He can, he can tell us everything he knows. He can preach the word to uh, God to us. He can, he can do all these things, but it's only going to bring us so far. Just like that axe had only floated so far. Notice it, it came and, it, and it, I imagine it just stopped right there. It says, he told him, reach down and take it. And he put out his hand and took it. The axe head did not fly out of the water and land back on the, on the, the handle and repair itself. It, it only came so far. The preaching, that stick that got thrown at it, only brought that axe head so far. And, it, and what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that the man of God, our pastors, our preachers, they can only bring us so far. At some point, we must decide 
whether or not we are going to continue in God's work. If we're going to stay in this thing for the long haul, we have to decide whether or not we're going to reach down, pick up that axe head, and keep it on there. We have to be the ones that decide, I'm going to keep my axe sharp, I'm going to keep it on the handle, I'm going to keep swinging this thing, I'm going to keep doing the work of God. We're the ones that have to decide that. You see, your, our pastors, they can, they can provide the place for the work of God. And they can, they can preach. They can provide the preaching. And they can provide the opportunity for us to go out and serve. But we're the ones that have to take advantage of it. We're the ones that have to do something with it. And like I said earlier, if we've fallen out, if, or if we ever do fall out, we have to remember it's a lot harder to get back in. So it's more profitable for us now to take heed to the things that we're being admonished to do so that we won't fall out. And the last thing I want to say is that God can use a broken axe. That God wants to use a broken axe. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, in verse 26, you know, God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. God wants to use, you know, is willing to use that broken axe. I think a lot of times people, they could come into the Christian life with a lot of baggage. They can come into life with, you know, their, boy, my axe is kind of splintered on the handle. It's not as nice as that guy's axe. It's not as sharp. It's a little rusty. There's a little nick in it here. You know, this is, this is an old beat up axe. But God can still use that axe in, in his work. And in fact, I believe that it just adds to the glory that, that, that God gets. You know, when we say, then we know that when that old, rusty, dull axe is the one that's falling down the tree, it's God that's, that's, that's doing the work for us. Now, I'll just conclude by just saying this, that God does have a great work that he wants us to accomplish. And he wants to use us as a means to accomplish that work. And he has given us a man of God to guide and direct us in that work. But our, it's our decision to make whether or not we're going to take heed to the man of God, whether or not we're going to follow the man of God. That's our decision that we've made. God has given us all these things, but it's up to us to do something with it. So let's just close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the deep truths of it. Lord, I thank you for the many things that we can glean from it. Father, I thank you for these people that, uh, that came out on a Sunday night and to hear the preaching of the word of God. Lord, I pray that something I said tonight uh, would benefit them. And Father, I pray that you would just bless us as we, as we go on our way. And Lord, that you would keep us all safe in those roads. And Lord, that you would uh, help us to meet together again when, uh, when the doors to your house are open. In Jesus' name, amen.